Hop on a train, fly away on a plane. Build a fort around your bed, stick a knife through a zombie's head. Seven days to die, you've got seven days to die. Seven days to die, you've got seven days to die. Welcome to Game Theory, researching the science behind apocalyptic zombie outbreaks like our lives depend on it, because they will. And that's no joke. Sure, we all laugh at the idea of the dead coming back to life to hunt us for our brains, but there's more than one way to make a zombie, my friends. A zombie is, at its most basic, a relentlessly aggressive human driven by some type of blood-borne infection. Very real, very deadly diseases like rabies and variant Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease, aka human mad cow disease already fit the zombie bill pretty darn closely, showing similar symptoms to what we normally associate with zombies, being spread through bites and infected meat, deteriorating the brain, heck, rabies even makes you avoid bright lights and fear the water. All it would really take is one country altering these guys just a little bit and then dropping it in the middle of a populated city and then boom, an all-you-can-eat brain buffet. And it's that happy thought, along with a brand sponsorship that leads us to the goal of today's episode, where, by the end of the video, you you will know the single best place in the world to ride out the inevitable zombie apocalypse. Start calling your travel agents now, my friends, because this one is the vacation of a lifetime. So like I mentioned, today's episode is inspired by the game Seven Days to Die, an open world zombie survival game that was recently launched on consoles for Xbox One and PS4, featuring a two player split screen mode, supporting four players online and player versus player, co-op survival, and co-op creative modes. Hashtag sponsor. It's basically Minecraft with zombies. Well, Minecraft already has zombies in it, so it's like Minecraft with zombies that aren't cuboidal, I guess? You punch things you probably shouldn't be punching, like rocks and trees in order to mine resources, and then you craft them into all manner of anti-zombie weaponry, like stone axes. You also use those resources to build elaborate bunkers, sometimes really elaborate bunkers, to protect yourself from the coming zombie hordes. And oh yeah, they're coming. Like the title of the game says, you pretty much have seven days to prepare yourself before the horde comes at you like a naked Miley Cyrus riding a wrecking ball. So hopefully you used your time and resources effectively to weather the storm. I like to think of this game as a school fire drill, except featuring the undead. First thing that I appreciate about Seven Days to Die is the fact that you have time to prepare. Most zombie fiction has you debilitated in some way, suddenly waking up into a world that's already gone to chaos, or the infection spreads so quickly that within a day the entire world is already gone. But honestly, that's that's not how the world works. Just think about how the media operates. As soon as one person comes down with Ebola or Zika virus, it is everywhere. And usually it's on Twitter hours before those stories start hitting the airwaves. If zombieism was truly becoming a thing and you had a computer, it shouldn't be catching you off guard. But the question is, how much time would you actually have to prepare? Honestly, it depends a lot on where you are and the type of zombieism it is. Luckily, I have an answer for both of these. Seven Days to Die's official wiki explains, quote, an un known virus is transforming human beings into bloodthirsty zombies. Nobody knows how, nobody knows why, and nobody knows how to stop it. But for as much of a vague cop-out as that might seem, it actually helps us a lot. As we talked about earlier, this aligns with the more modern and realistic interpretation of getting infected by a zombie disease. And epidemiologists, the people who study diseases, have done a ton of work to model how fast all sorts of diseases spread. And no joke, this includes stuff like our zombie virus. For this, epidemiologists use special disease models like the SIR model, which stands for Susceptible, Infected, Recovered. Using this model, you can see how fast the disease spreads through a population. This page shows models for a whole bunch of our favorite diseases and what happens to a population of 100 people when they get it. Flu, chicken pox, and measles all spread fastest, but smallpox and Ebola are actually the most deadly. It's like the classic fable, the tortoise and the hare. Slow and steady kills the human race. The problem with using these traditional traditional 
models for zombies, though, is that in general, for regular diseases, you either get better or you die. It keeps everything all neat and tidy-like. But for zombies, neither of these things really happen. You just keep on undead living and infecting things. This means that zombie epidemics spread much faster than a regular disease. And because people are zombies, they don't realize they're sick, they don't go to hospitals, they're not quarantined, nothing. It's also not a debilitating disease where you're stuck in bed recovering. Being a zombie actually compels you to specifically seek out uninfected people. So how do you know how much time you actually have in the event of an outbreak? Well, turns out I'm not the first person to ask that question. In fact, in March of last year, Cornell did a full epidemiological model of a zombie apocalypse based on bloodborne virus models. In short, it's exactly what we need. Glad to see those college tuition dollars at work there, guys, tackling the questions that truly affect us all. Cancer? Yeah, the cure for that can wait. More zombie studies! Anyway, this modeling tool allows us to set our parameters and see just how long it'll actually take a country like the US to be overrun by a zombie horde. In this particular simulation, we can enter parameters for the spread of the virus, like kill-bite ratio, how many people are killed for every bite. Now, we know that almost everyone who gets bitten by zombies goes on to become one, so we're setting this ratio as very low. 0.2. We're also gonna be giving the zombies fairly decent mango legs. A 15 minute mile, which means these aren't your grandma's shambler zombies. Oh no. These guys are gonna be briskly walking between slaughtering innocent victims. We also wanna make this the worst case scenario possible. So to do that, we're gonna have the outbreak start in the city with the busiest airport in the US. Surprisingly, that's not New York. It's Atlanta, Georgia, followed closely by LA, then New York, and then Dallas. Press the button and here, here we go! Let's watch as millions of people get eaten alive in front of us. Here you can see the zombie outbreak spread on a national scale in front of you. And while it may look like it's slow going, let me give you a sense of what you're looking at exactly. Once this virus lands in New York City, you have less than four hours to get off the island of Manhattan before statistically everyone in New York is a zombie. Four hours. Because we started the outbreak in Atlanta, which has so many flights to other cities, it also means the epidemic isn't going to stay in Atlanta for very long as it reaches almost every other airport hub in the U.S. within the first 24 hours. Two days in and New York, Philly, Boston, and Rhode Island are all gone. New Jersey is too, but it's not like you'll be able to tell the difference. Most of the West Coast is knocked out once the virus reaches San Francisco and Portland at hour 42. Florida is gone in 50, which means a lot of zombie retirees will be headed north looking for blood and their social security checks. In a little over three days, the whole eastern seaboard is gone, except for like the toe of Maine. If you're there, there's basically no escape, so just enjoy some nice lobster and wait for the horde to arrive. At five days in, most of the southeast has been hit, and from the west coast, the virus is in the process of hopping over the Rocky Mountains. At 192 hours, or exactly seven days, about 50% of the U.S. is entirely wiped out. Yeah, it moves that fast. Now don't get me wrong, it's definitely faster than literally any disease in recorded history. But at seven days, there are still plenty of places that are zombie free. And from here on out, the disease starts to lose steam. According to our model, there would actually be huge sections where you could be safe for a lot more than seven days. Sure, it's decimated the populated cities and their surrounding areas, but getting to more rural parts of the country is gonna take a lot longer. In fact, according to our model, it would take about a thousand hours to cover the entire US. A thousand an hours translates to 41 days, well over one month of prep time. It's not too shabby, but now that we know how much time we have to prepare, what do we do with it? Seven Days to Die presents an interesting case because it doesn't have a win scenario. It's all about surviving as long as you can against the waves of oncoming zombies. It's about establishing a new sustainable life where just one of the normal daily hazards is the occasional run-in with a zombie, or 20. My trick hip starts to act up whenever there's a zombie horde coming. It's like the weather. Oh, planning for rain today? Bring the umbrella. Oh, planning for the zombie horde today? Make sure you bring the pickaxe and shotgun. That's something most zombie media never address that if this were truly happening in real life, there's a chance that there's no end game. I mean, sure, maybe over hundreds of years, all the zombies in the apocalypse die out and humans start to repopulate the Earth, but most of the time, the best you're gonna do is find a way to survive. Basically, until something normal kills you, like heart disease or a vending machine crushing you. Huzzah! You died in a normal way. A winner is you. So with that lighthearted goal in mind, in the time that you have, it's time to travel to the part of the world most conducive to long term post-apocalyptic survival, and then start building the base of your dreams. But that leaves the big question, where are you gonna go to escape the zombie hordes and live in your self-sustaining utopia?
utopia. Well, let's stop and realistically think about the resources you'll need. First, major cities are definitely out. Too many people. So you're looking for a place with a low population density, i.e. a low number of people crammed into every square kilometer of that city. This map shows the different population densities across the world, and you can already quickly eliminate the coastlines of most continents, including Australia, all of Eastern Asia, most of the Middle East and India, and everywhere in Europe. Seriously, look at it. Everywhere in Europe. No joke, all you European theorists out there, if a zombie apocalypse is coming, you best make like the UK and Brexit that sh**. From there, we need to think about the survivalists' rule of threes, which states that you'll be dead in three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, three days without water, and three weeks without food. Of all of those, having a reliable source of fresh water is gonna be one of the most important and hardest to find, since we can't expect the zombies to be manning the water purification plants in the middle of their busy schedules of shambling and generalized terror. Knowing that most coastlines are too dense with people to be safe, we need to look more towards lakes and rivers in the middle of countries as our potential solution. This map shows us the major freshwater deposits of the world, helping us to quickly narrow the field, with the Great Lakes here in the United States and Lake Victoria in Africa really jumping out as some of our top contenders. However, there's another major factor at play here, insects. With our zombieism being carried as an infection in the blood, insects like mosquitoes become a huge risk factor, especially once we start talking about setting up shop in the vicinity of standing water. Zombie insects. Yep, the scariest biters you never see on The Walking Dead. Car, we gotta protect ourselves from the biters. Just light a citronella candle, Dad. And based on this map of mosquito distribution, you see that most of Africa and huge chunks of South America are just gone. The northern part of the Great Lakes, though, is still a fair option, as the climate in Canada gets cold enough to kill off most of the threatening insects. And this applies to the blood-sucking ticks, too. But that brings our other rule of three consideration into play. Food. Does it get too cold to grow food there? Because remember, this is a game without an ending. You gotta survive indefinitely, and you can't be waiting around for the super Walmart to open its doors again, my friend. That $4,000 Costco zombie survival kit, which is an entirely legitimate product that they sell full of dehydrated and canned food, is only meant to last you for four years. And if you have a family, you can bet that that's gonna disappear fast. If you truly want control over your own destiny, eventually you're gonna have to farm your own food. Something it's worth mentioning that you see in all the most successful bases in Seven Days to Die. Internal agriculture. Looks like Farmer Rick may have had him a good idea. Carl, I gotta tend to the goji berries. So at this point, I gotta ask, are you sick of maps? Well, too bad. This is a matter of your life or death. So here's one on agricultural sustainability across the globe. And as you can see, there are just some climates that are too cold, like Russia, and too hot, like the Australian outback. But it looks like the northern Great Lakes are still at play, getting warm enough to allow for harvesting crops, but still cold enough at different times of the year for killing the deadly zombie insects before they pose a threat. Plus, with its strong variation in temperature across seasons, you can grow yourself a healthy mix of fruits and vegetables, like apples, cherries, and blueberries in the summer, and even nutrient-rich leafy greens like bok choy. They even have themselves the new super berry, the Hascap. Oh yeah, I looked up agricultural trends in Canada for this one. I now know planting seasons like a mofo up in this his house. We should add in some, uh, 90s era, like, hip-hop Snoop Dogg, that like high-pitched street vibe thing that you get, so we can have a picture of me with like deal with it sunglasses photoshopped on top. Just ask me about plant hardiness levels. I can tell ya. And if you're looking for meat, well, first off, be careful because it might be infected. But secondly, go fishing in the Great Lakes. Another awesome perk of the location. So there it is. Ontario, Canada. The best place in the world to escape from the zombie apocalypse. Complete with a low population density, plenty of fresh water for drinking, fishing, and protecting your tasty flesh from zombie hordes, temperatures low enough to kill off pathogen carrying insects, but also high enough to grow a wide variety of foods to supply all of your essential nutrients. Dear Ontario, feel free to slap that one onto your tourism brochures. Ontario, you won't get bit. But I wasn't content to just rest there. I dove even deeper to find the exact county that would work best in a zombie apocalypse. And it is, drumroll please. <laughs> 
still don't have good sound effects for this sort of thing? Whatever, it's Norfolk. Population density, 14 people per square kilometer. You are out there on your own, my friend. Right next to the water with some of the best farmland in Canada. Book your tickets now, my friend. Start learning how to tap trees for maple syrup and get comfortable, because you're going to be there for a while. Except, maybe not. In an ironic twist, the sheer fact that I've talked to you all about it on the show now nullifies its role as a non-brain-dead utopia. You all will see this video, and when the fecal matter actually starts to hit the fan, some portion of you might actually head there. Even if it's like 1% in this video's viewership lifetime, that might equal over 10,000 people all fleeing to the same tiny town in Canada, thus eliminating the first criteria that we started this whole thing with. Priority number one, lack of people. Well, it was fun while it lasted. And since the number one spot's been overrun, I guess that means you'll have to be heading to the second best place, which is... <laughs> yeah, right. I'm keeping that one to myself, my friends. No hard feelings. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. If you love zombies and want even more, click right here to hop over to Film Theory, where I've covered the science behind zombie decay rates to predict the ending of The Walking Dead, which is shockingly much closer than you might think. Or if you just feel like hanging out on Game Theory, then click here to watch this super old video on the channel, which features me in a desert smashing watermelons, all in an attempt to test out zombie murder tools. Real talk, it was all just a glorified excuse for me to get to test out a new camera that I had bought at the time, but Man, it was super fun. And finally, one last thanks to 7 Days to Die for sponsoring this video without me having to say a bunch of corporate shilling. At the end of the day, I feel like we did some good work here, giving me an excuse to prepare the world, just a little bit more, for hacking away at our fellow undead neighbors. So that's all for today. Next week, a very real, very shocking expose on a topic that could very easily affect video games and the way they relate to the internet. See you then.